Good morning, folks. We may as well be begin. Uh, my name is Rob Hubert. I'm the interim director for the Center for Military Security and Strategic Studies. It is indeed our privilege to be able to invite the ambassador to the Ukraine to come and talk to us. But before I introduce her, I just have a, I'd like to make the um, land acknowledgement uh, that the University of Calgary is located in the heart of southern Alberta, both acknowledges and pays tri tribute to the traditional territories of the people of Treaty 7, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprised of the Siska, the Pinalan, and the Kani First Nations, and the Tassin First Nation, and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chikina Bearpaw, and Good Stony First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nations of Alberta, Districts 5 and 6. The ambassador was first appointed to the Ukraine Ambassador to Canada and arrived to Ottawa on March 29, 2022. She has spent almost 10 years of experience in executive positions in public administration and Ukraine investment promotion. Prior to joining the embassy, the ambassador held the position of the deputy head of the office of the president of Ukraine in charge of economic policy development and IFI coordinations. She has had a very extensive career, both in the private and in the public. And as all of us, of course, are very much looking forward to hearing, being the ambassador of a state that is, of course, at war right now, carries all sorts of critical ramifications. We are very happy to be able to give her an, uh, um, the opportunity to discuss some of the challenges that Ukraine faces. Uh, she will be talking for about 20 or so minutes, and at which point we will be opening it up for your questions, for discussion, issues that you want to know from her. So, Ambassador, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. It. Um, first of all, uh, it's my great pleasure, my honor, and I'm also a bit of, you know, it's not afraid, but still to talk to the students uh, because it takes a lot of responsibility. You are those uh, who will shape the, the future. And I think it's important for you to know, remember every day when you're going to the campus that we all are witnessing now the world that has been significantly challenged. And many of this rule-based order that we all were benefiting since actually the Second World War is cracking down. And I would like to talk to you today about both, you know, the, the situation in Ukraine, but also a bit of the implication of Russian uh, full-scale invasion and actually a Russian war against Ukraine that started back in 2014 and the implication it has on the global security. And that's important for people to know on the, all the continents because it, the, the consequences of Russian invasion has far-reaching effect on many countries, on the citizens around the globe. And thank you for hosting me today. It's my mm, great pleasure to be at this university and it's so beautiful and I'm really jealous that you as a student have this opportunity to, to study here. Um, so um, to start with, I think we this is the biggest conventional war on the European continent since the Second World War. And this war started 10 years ago when Russia first occupied Crimea and the eastern uh, territories of Ukraine. That's where we, it all started. But if we look back um, on the history and just understanding what, what Russia is, um, the reality is that Russian, Russia is rather weak. And I was really surprised, to be frank, when I came uh, to Canada back in on 29th of March, almost two years ago, uh, when the war started. I was, now I can't say it publicly, I was very surprised meeting a lot of people um, who still were living in this bubble that Russia is a huge power, that Russia is a nuclear power, Russia was so-called second biggest army in the world. And many people at that time uh, were looking at me 
You know, and when I was saying that Ukraine will win, we will resist, we will not fall down, um, I just saw in the eyes of the people the two things. First, they were looking at me and saying like, poor lady. You know, you, we don't uh, actually believe that Ukraine can withstand. And the second thing, there was a kind of a fear of Russia. There was this big myth um, around many experts that Russia, because of its nuclear weapons, because it's the place in uh, UN Security Council, which Russia actually illegally took, because that was the place of former Soviet Union with just Russian representatives that just change the name and that's it, so nobody have any legacy on how it happened. Uh, what's, what actually changed for these two years, that this myth and prejudice that Russia is so strong, I think has already fallen down. Because Ukraine, when the full invasion started, we were much smaller economy, much smaller country in terms of the population, and of course, much smaller, um, military power. So when Russian tanks were crossing Ukrainian border on February 24th, and when Russian were bombing all the airport infrastructure and the military infrastructure on that morning, um, many of the experts, intelligence, politics around the world were just counting days uh, when Ukraine will fall down. And Russia itself, we have a lot of evidence that Russian, some of the Russian generals were holding even this, you know, smart uniform for the victory parade in Kyiv that they uh, were expecting to have in days or weeks. Uh, Russia has already strategically failed in Ukraine because we are today, we're two years of uh, the full-scale invasion with none of the Russian strategic goal has was, was accomplished. And we also see uh, that much smaller country, much smaller military power, much smaller economy, much smaller in terms of the population, but with the great resistance, with the great common value and course, can not only resist the aggressor, but can also make successful counteroffensive, can uh, be able to liberate its land and to hurt this power. So I think, you know, if we look from this two years of the war, which continues uh, these days, um, this myth about undefeatable Russia has already cracked down. If we look back why it's important for Ukraine to win, and to, this is the, the core goal, because we need to restore this international rule-based order. Just a small example for you, and I will go on for the different dimensions of this war um, and its implication. Ukraine, when Ukraine became the independent state, and Canada was the uh, first Western country to recognize Ukraine independence, and that is the huge legacy of Prime Minister Brian Mulroney, who just uh, passed away. Um, Ukraine was holding the third biggest number of nuclear warheads in the world. Back then, Ukraine uh, made a decision to refuse of the nuclear warheads that were in Ukraine. In exchange, uh, Ukraine and four other countries, including Russia, signed the Budapest, so-called Budapest Memorandum. Uh, it stated that these four countries will guarantee Ukraine's sovereignty, independence, and territorial integrity. So when Russia first occupied Crimea and our eastern regions and then made a full-scale invasion, this is a, one of the examples how the international rules and international agreements Russia just undermined. And this is also important for all the other countries which have boundaries with Russia, including Canada, uh, to always remember. Russia never followed any of these promises and commitments. That's why it's also important when there are some uh, Russian propagandists who are trying to say that Russia is ready to negotiate. Ukraine, since 2014, has two, over 200 rounds of different negotiations with Russia. 
none of them were successful because Russia was refusing to follow the international rule, UN Charter, and many other agreements it has done. This, this war has already the impact, as I've said, to many countries and many people around the world. And I'll just uh, put you back a bit of the history for these two years. When Russian tanks uh, invaded, and if you look at it from the military tactics, uh, of course, uh, we were preparing to the war, but you can't be 100% prepared for such a big scale war that is happening. And uh, one of the most important lessons that we can learn as of now is the motivation and the call of the population. Because as the invasion started, all Ukrainians took a very strong standing against the Russian aggressors. Many of them within the first days of the war were lining up uh, those were students, journalists, doctors, engineers, IT people who are lining for the conscription to voluntarily go to the army and fight. There were civilians who um, were turning their knowledge, turning their previous different experience to benefit for Ukraine's resistance. There was even the pensioners who were preparing so-called Molotov cocktails and uh, downing uh, Russian drones across the country. But uh, one of the first things that Russia did is, uh, was the strategy of using food and energy as a weapon. And the big uh, strategy of Russia was by using it as a weapon towards our allies, our partners, and many of the countries uh, in Global South uh, for whom food is uh, one of the most important things just to, to provide it to the people. Um, Russia blocked uh, the Black Sea port, which is the main route of all Ukrainian export of food on the global market. And Ukraine, very similar to Canada, we are among both of the nations and the countries are among top five exporters of grain in the world. So what was the Russian strategy at that time to block the export? Uh, we were observing the record high prices for food for the last 50 years. So that caused inflation, both in the Western countries and the many countries uh, with emerging economies who were suffering. The longer strategy was to continue to increase the food prices and even at the risk of the famine uh, and to cause the immigration, including the huge flow of immigration uh, to the Western countries. And that's how to challenge the unity in support of Ukraine. Energy was another weapon. And we all understand that energy plays a huge role in geopolitics because the access to energy resources is vital for develop any of the economy. And the lesson, which I think we already learned, that energy security is an important pillow of the security of any country. And I can tell you and share the history of Ukraine and, and how we probably were even far before the Europe in understanding the risks of the dependence on Russian fossil fuels and the actions we took. So uh, historically, Ukraine was very dependent on Russian, mostly the Russian gas supply. But Russia used the gas supply not only like on, on building their economy and the revenue flows, but also to gain the political influence to Ukraine and to many other countries in Europe. So um, what they were trying to do is to negotiate with the governments the long-term contracts for the cheap Russian gas and trying to get the political benefits and the influence on the economies and the politics around these countries. We learned our painful lesson back in 2012 at that time, President of Ukraine Yanukovych, which is now lives in Russia, uh, fleeing the, the criminal charges and the prosecution in Ukraine, um, he signed an agreement uh, to procure a cheap Russian gas for the years ahead. But what was the trade-off? Trade-off uh, for Russia was a strategic one, and we now understand and learn it. It was the agreement which Ukraine signed under Yanukovych uh, to prolong the Russian Navy fleet 
uh, base in Crimea. And that actually was used for Russia to increase their presence in Crimea and then uh, in 2014 uh, to occupy Crimea. So we learned our uh, hard lesson of how the energy dependence on Russia and on Russian fossil fuel could undermine the, and could bring the, the risks for the sovereignty of the country. Back in 2015, uh, Ukraine fully refused from any of the gas supply uh, from Russia and switched to the European uh, supply. What Russia was also uh, doing by providing Ukraine a cheap gas, it was undermining all the economic uh, incentives to invest in Ukrainian gas production. And Ukraine has the second biggest gas reserves in Europe. But because of the cheap prices, there was no business case and no companies were ready to invest just because uh, at that time, the monthly bill for the gas to Ukrainian households was more or less the cost of the package of cigarettes. So no energy efficiency, no investment in production, and more and more dependence on Russian gas supply. We made that hard decision in 2015. It was pretty hard decision when we fully liberalized market, we just cut off the dependence on Russian gas. And we started explaining our European partners that this is a matter of national security. Uh, I will be frank, it was not very well heard. And there was a continuous debate of building the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, which will increase the European dependency on Russian energy. Uh, finally, the project was finished and only when Russia invaded Ukraine in 2022, the sanctions were imposed on the Nord Stream 2. But that was not the end of Russian uh, using energy as a weapon and blackmailing. We all saw what happened with the Nord Stream 1 pipeline. And out of the sun in Russia was blackmailing Europe kind of a, for the freezing winter for the record high prices for oil and gas back in 2022 and trying to also to undermine not only the energy sector of European countries, but also the economic growth, because the high energy prices and lack of the gas supply is, uh, is damaging economies. What we saw also as a lesson, it was a remarkable response of the crisis from our European partners. If we would Talk, it, if we would be talking with you three years ago, nobody would believe that Germany will be able to build LNG terminals for nine months. But that was the matter of national security. And as we see now, there is a total shift in European gas consumption, diversification. And I think our European partners learned very quickly the, this lesson. and. Um, and Russian play uh, and Russian influence on all of the Western countries uh, in the energy sector was significantly undermined. We can talk a lot of, if we are coming back to the Budapest Memorandum and also Russia stepping down from the uh, non-nuclear proliferation treaties, is also Russia is rising the stakes, uh, but also, uh, undermining just the, the basic things from the security, which were built since the, the Second World War. Um, what is Russian strategy in this war? Um, Russian strategy is this war in, uh, against Ukraine is uh, they have the idea to be able, by their own decision, to you know, redraw the borders of the sovereign countries. Um, they want to have the full control over Ukraine, and they want to undermine Ukraine as a nation. And uh, you know why it is important uh, for the full Ukrainian victory and the restoration of the sovereign borders? Because we can't let any of the country which just undermine those international rules, and uh, being a military power, to be able to. Uh, to do this. Because if you look on the consequences that could be out of this, uh, it means that uh, you know, none of the international institutions will further work. 
And the only thing to protect both the small countries and big countries, economically developed and those who are emerging economies, and the only way to secure the countries will be a huge, huge military investment and a huge military sector, which of course will put a pressure to all of the people in these countries, because that will mean that instead of you know, supporting economic growth, supporting free trade, uh, supporting the um, uh, address to the climate change, in order to protect sovereignty of the countries, uh, We'll just need to produce more tanks, more missiles, more uh, artillery. That is what Russia doing. This year, uh, Russian budget for the military defense sector and law enforcement is 40% of all Russian budget. Russia, we need not to undermine it, continues to significantly increase its spendings into the defense. It's, um, but there is one more, uh, why Russia can afford it? Because still the major revenue flow from Russia is from its fossil fuels export. And still Russian gas is being supplied to many markets. And the introduced price cap has not much of the influence on Russian ability to get this, um, uh, these revenues. So here is one more link how energy is still uh, important in the geopolitics and in this particular case on Russia being able to, um, to continue its increased uh, defense sector. But also we see that um, what Russia was, what, what probably Russia was at that time uh, expecting that there will be no unity in the, uh, among the partners. And we can say it now quite obvious that the reaction of all of our Western allies back in 2014, when Russia occupied Crimea and part of Ukraine, uh, was a, you know, a diplomatic wor words which I hate as a North Korea diplomat, which is a deep concern. It's a very, you know, word that does not have much of the meaning in the reality. So that was back in 2014. That was a deep concern. And the problem is it's a different way of how democracies uh, perceive this deep concern and how dictators like Putin uh, just accept this deep concern. For them, it's a green light. You know, nothing is happening. Like, okay, everybody is not happy. There are some smaller sanctions. So probably the strategy to go further can work. And we see it in all the Russian history. When Russia invaded Georgia, that was deep concern. When Russia occupied Crimea, that was deep concern. When Russia supported atrocities in Syria, that was deep concern. So when President Zelensky, just a few weeks before the full-scale invasion started, was in Munich with the major security conference around the globe, the Munich Security Conference, he was very clearly uh, saying to the world leaders about preemptive sanctions saying like, we need to show Putin's strengths where you are. But there was no. And for Putin, it was another deep concern. So what probably he was not miscalculated is that how much the, the unity among the partners grew up quickly. NATO today is more stronger than ever. And the two countries, Finland and Sweden, if you, we would be talking like a four or five years ago, nobody probably say that these countries will be so quickly becoming NATO members as they are now. And there was a kind of a, uh, it was a bit of, it's not a joke, but uh, when Ukraine was saying to all the NATO members that we should be also the NATO country, the NATO member, uh, there were some diplomats who were telling us, yeah, you know, you should probably take a pass off uh, Finland, some kind of the Finlandization model, a model to Ukraine. And now we say, yes, Finlandization model to Ukraine was a quick access to NATO. That's something, you know, uh, what would work well. Because one of the things, if we look on many Eastern European countries, their security is based on being a NATO member. And that's, and that's the reality. So today, uh, Ukraine is, fighting 
to protect the eastern flank of NATO. Today, like uh, Ukraine's resistance is something what on the one side is kicking off Russian tanks from NATO border. The reality is also that Russian missiles, and you probably, I don't know whether you saw the reports, just yesterday Russian missile, which was hitting Ukraine, it was in the airspace of Poland for a few short moments, but it was. The where she hit drones, uh, who already were thrown down and fall to one of the NATO countries. It's not so far away. And just for you to compare, from Halifax to Lviv, Ukraine is the same distance for, like from Halifax to Victoria. And why it's important also, I think here, because what's happening now, Russia is, has these crazy goals, which they already you know, strategically defeat, but still Russia is unfortunately capable to further increase in presence, including the military presence in Arctic. And that is where Russia is Canada's neighbor. And Arctic is the region uh, which, which is huge in natural resources. And what we also understand from our long lasting, very painful history of unfortunately having Russia as a neighbor, that post-Soviet Union collapse, Russia was never successful as a country. Having such a huge natural resources, having the biggest territory in the world, Russian economy is smaller than the economy of Canada. Russia was never able to be an economically prosperous country. And the only way the country was developing is by developing its natural resources, and this is the core of their economy. But the current uh, natural resources, they are not unlimited, so they are deploying. And with the same pattern what Russia did for the last 33 years, it will continue to find the new resource base in order just to Putin's dictatorship and Russian oligarch and the Russian regime to survive. That's why, you know, uh, Arctic is an important field to look at and understanding, you know, what's, what is the potential Russian interest there and its matters on the non-security for many Arctic countries. If we come back to the battlefield, within the military strategy, within these two years, mm, Russia has much more tanks, much more artillery, much more uh, ammunition, ballistic missiles, hypersonic missiles, so now, almost ordinary Ukrainian citizen have, by hearing the noise, could, could tell you whether it's the Iranian Shahid drones or whether it's the missile flying. That's the reality of 40 million nations today. And just today in the morning, the ballistic missile hit downtown Kyiv just 300 meters from the school where my children were going two years ago. So it's, it's very close. It was like it was intercepted. That was only the debris, uh, but that's uh, what Ukraine is living through. And one of the other Russian strategies in Ukraine is to um, destroy energy infrastructure. They've tried to do it back in the winter 2022-2023, just to try to lower morale of the people by you know causing blackouts, by destroying all the electricity and utilities. Mm -hmm deprive people in the cold winters from water supply, from heating supply, they failed. Um, but if we look on the battlefield, what is new to this battlefield is that technology matters. It's not the conventional war that it was like Second World War. It's the war where drones, where UAVs uh, make a difference. So when and we are on the front of it. Uh, Ukraine has not only managed to retake part of this territory, a bigger part of the both the Kyiv region, Kharkiv region, but it also was managed to destroy almost 33% of Russian Black Sea fleet. So back, uh, as I've told you, that Russia was blocking the seaports of the Black Sea, like not to allow Ukrainian Ukraine and the export now, 
Because of that military victory, Ukraine continued to export grain and other resources on the global market on the pre-war level. And that is because of the mixture of the Western weapons to Ukraine and a mixture of Ukrainian technology and the newly de developed Ukrainian sea drones. Uh, this sector is developing very rapidly in Ukraine. I was just two times in February in Ukraine, and I will tell you, every person on the street is talking about the drones. Drones is becoming, and drones, electronic warfare, and a lot of this technology is becoming a new way of the warfare. The small drone, which cost a few thousand dollars, in a capable hand of of Ukrainians is able to destroy the uh, weapons cost of millions, ten of millions of dollars. The small dog can destroy a tank in the hands of uh, motivated and qualified uh, Ukrainians. And that is also the, the lesson that needs to be learned. And many of the countries, including like Canada, who has been training many of Ukrainian uh, soldiers since 2015 and now, um, it's not only about training Ukrainian troops, it's exchanging the experience. Because at the end of this war, Ukrainian army will be one of the strongest army, not only in Europe, uh, but among all of the NATO countries. Um, another thing uh, of, another dimension of the war, it is the cyber war. And it's, it's also something that is not a traditional in the, you know, the military strategy books, because it's something what evolves as technology develops. And, uh, and that, Russian attacks have no boundaries. So it, you know, the geographical position of the country does not have, give you much security on the cyber attacks. And cyber attacks have different uh, uh, aims. One of them has just the aim to blackmail to cause some economic damages. There are many uh, cyber attacks which have far-reaching consequences that just, you know, shutting down the website or, or, or some, you know, um, electronic systems. Part of them has the aim to get access to the technology, to the R&D, which actually just stealing the innovations, which actually could cause the harm to the companies, to the countries, which can cost billions of dollars in the years ahead. And uh, we are also on the front line of this. Uh, when the invasion started, it was a parallel when a lot of Russian cyber attacks were happening on mobile operators, on government agencies, on the uh, banking sector. So we withstand it. And there are a lot of lessons we, we are sharing now how to deal with the cyber attacks. And this is one of the strong cooperation we have with Canada. We value it because um, this is a part of the new warfare and the new kind of attacks um, that are very dangerous. And there is one more which deserves a special, special attention that is disinformation. It is another field what we observe. And Russian disinformation campaign is Kremlin one. They invest hundreds of millions of dollars into the different types of disinformation. So they have few of the goals on this disinformation. When we are talking about the Western countries, Russia has the big goal to undermine the support of Ukraine. So you can see, and you know, I'm feeling here, like for these two years, the, uh, the number of trolls in the social media, the number of fakes account. If we look even further with the uh, AI and deep fake, that will become a scary thing in terms of distributing and you know, producing this disinformation. In Ukraine, this disinformation is focused to undermine morale, unity, and undermine the political and military leadership of Ukraine. And this is specifically what Russia is trying to, to target. And even on the military front, 
Uh, the, for example, the, the case I can share that um, the, social, uh, the, so, uh, the soldiers on the front line, they all have their cell phones. Yeah? So they also read the news, they have social media accounts. And Russia was reaching to them, man messaging that, you know, your commanders in chief already are cooperating in Russia. You just need to stop fighting and, you know, uh, raise the white flag. Otherwise, you know, we are encircling you and you will. So they are trying to even specifically target specific units on the front line with this targeted disinformation campaigns to undermine the, the morale of the soldiers. And that is we, the lessons we learned and we, we are sharing among uh, our partners. But um, um, there was a strong response. Sometimes for us Ukrainians, it seems like not very timely because the, um, uh, when the war started, uh, was this expectation that Ukraine can fall down in the days of, of weeks. There was the, you know, the very famous uh, quote from President Zelensky that I don't, I need gun rather than the right. And, you know, we still need guns. We still need the, the weapon support. Uh, support with the modern weapon, with the modern technology. It was evolving. And if you remember back in 2022, the very first months of the invasion, all the NATO member countries told us, you can't use the NATO standard weapons, you can't deal with them, you are not trained. Now, for example, when first time the Patriot air defense system uh, intercepted the new Russian hypersonic missile, it was eye-opening for many of, uh, of our um, partners. Uh, we are learning very quickly. Ukraine is now the equipment of many producers from many countries, so it's also sharing this experience, what works, what not work, and we are a huge testing ground for the new technology, including the ones I've told, which is the drones, electronic war prayer. So it's where the, this, this is the war of technology. And so we can't, you know, have produce and have more tanks than Russia because still they are taking from the deposits the tanks that were used in the Second World War and a bit of produced in probably 1950s. Uh, but we need to be all together more technological. And this is the way how it changes the, the, way, of, uh, uh, the way of the war. And there is one more important thing that uh, is still um, influencing on Russia, but there is a lot thing to do, which is the sanctions. Of course, all the Western countries were stepping in with the robust sanctions. And um, they are hurting Russian economy. The effect is not probably as immediate as everybody you know, used to when you do a tweet that you impose the sanction. The second day, you would like to, to expect that you know, the, the economy will, uh, just Russian economy will drop down, no. But in reality, Russia and its military and defense sector is not able to substitute the Western technology. So what we see, and this is a very unfortunate reality, that on many of the weapons that we intercept and we destroy, we see a huge number of Western spare parts still there. So, and we are sharing it among our partners and just trying to say that it's like you're shooting in your own leg. Supporting Ukraine was the, the, the military support and weapons, and in parallel, the Western companies have continued to supply Russia with the technology. But it also gives us the understanding that without the Western spare parts, Russian defense sector is not able uh, to produce a lot. That's why, you know, Russia went to North Korea and we have already 24 cases of North Korean ballistic missiles hitting Ukraine. North Korea provide the ammunition to Russia, over 1.5 million rounds, and Iranian Shahid drones are unfortunately hitting almost now everyday Ukrainian cities, which also gives us another understanding that it's not only Russia. Russia is trying to build this ex of evil with the countries that are of a huge security challenge to all of the Western democracies. So that's why 
victory in Ukraine is not only important for 40 million country, it's important for all of us because that's the battle between the Western democracies and the values that we share and the autocracy and tyranny. And many of those countries, including the global south, who are now emerging economies, some of them are already emerging democracies, this is the way how they make that decision, whether they will further continue to develop as a democracies, or they will see that democracies, it's not a secure way because it's all, always complicated when you have fair elections, when you have you know, to care about the people and their voices. Probably it's easier to, to switch to the model what, what Russia has. Whatever they just had so-called elections, whatever figure Putin wanted, they could put as a result of these elections. So this is a much bigger choice on understanding on what will be the world where we live, meaning where democracy will prevail or many other countries will switch and join this acts of evil, and whether the prosperity of each of our country will continue to be growing or military capability would be the most important thing to secure the, you know, the so to say, security of the citizens. So that's the choice. And that's what I think more and more countries in the world understand. And that's why, mm, but on the other hand, Ukraine also wants peace. We haven't started this war. So uh, that's why Ukraine also, in terms of the diplomatic outreach, we put a very uh, um, kind of a straightforward but important uh, initiative with Ukraine in peace formula. Uh, Ukraine wants peace, but Ukraine wants peace without, Ukraine wants peace and security around all Ukrainian sovereign borders. And there are many of the other things that we already learned from this war, and we need also to share with the world to avoid any other conflict. And probably the last thing I will share with you an example, I don't want like, to be too boring and probably ask, uh, answer more of your questions. It's also in terms of the nuclear security. This is the first ever war where civilian nuclear power facilities are of the military target. The biggest nuclear power generation in the European continent, which is a Parisian nuclear power plant, six gigawatt of electricity capacity, is almost for two years under Russian occupation. There are many of the EAEI reports that there is a military presence near reactors. We have a multiple cases of the territory there are uh, the armored vehicles were standing in the facilities of the nuclear power station. The engineers were under significant Russian pressure. There is no proper maintenance. The electricity lines which were entering the power station were uh, destroyed several times. So it also the first time that it takes a risk uh, for the civilian nuclear object. And we as a country who went through the horror of Chernobyl, one of the biggest nuclear disasters, we are, we are trying to explain everybody, it's, it's already two years when the big nuclear power station is not properly maintained. There is no proper trade personnel because all the Ukrainian personnel was removed from there. This is the alarming risk. That's why the peace formula, which contains 10 points, including the points where the Food cannot be the weapon. Nuclear cannot be the weapon. Um, energy cannot be a weapon. People cannot be used in the war. Like Russia did taking out 19,000 of Ukrainian children and illegally deport them to Russia and illegally uh, trying to put them in, in the families just, because this is the crime of the genocide. This is a part of the genocide crime where by the way, Putin is under the global arrest order from International Court of Justice. But these are the, the peace formula, what we presented, it's, and saying it's not only for long-standing and 
um, comprehensive peace of Ukraine. It's also for the benefit of the other countries to try to figure out the consequences and the lessons of this war, not to repeat it again. Thank you. cover such a massive amount of information. I know that it has undoubtedly created questions within our audience, so we have till about 5 to 12. So please just uh, identify yourself and, um, and uh, speak clearly on, on your question. touch it anymore, <laughs> sorry. Um, we've done a major step back in 2015 when we totally stopped buying any of the Russian gas. So uh, before the war, the energy kind of a balance uh, of Ukraine was two thirds was of the consumption was Ukrainian production and one third was the import from European Union, just the market. Uh, Ukraine has a huge uh, energy infrastructure. It had the biggest uh, natural gas storage in Europe. Uh, but we also started significantly invest in our own domestic production, which was like a for over a decade declining, because as I've explained you many reasons, but most it's like Russia driven. Um, we uh, now, um, I think this year, the 2023, was the first year when partly driven by the economic decline, so the war itself shrinked the economy almost 30%. Uh, that's, of course, also had an impact on the, the gas supply. So this was the first year when Ukraine was self-sustained. And what still is remarkable, during these two years of the war, the gas production in Ukraine continues to grow around 3.5%, which is like uh, for the, the energy industry, a huge achievement taking into account that you're, you know, you're operating in the wartime. Um, for us in the future, the diversification is the strategy. Diversification both internally as the sources of energy and externally. Uh, so because Ukraine also uh, during the wartime we started our official negotiations to become a EU member. We are undergoing major reforms to, uh, to become on a fast track uh, full uh, EU member. So the part of our focus is the renewable energy. And this is uh, of, a, you know, there are few of the types of the renewable energy, both wind and solar power and biomass and biogas, because being an agricultural country, that's a logic source, source of energy. But what we saw also when, when Russia occupied uh, and uh, southern region in Ukraine, you know what they first did? They just destroyed all the solar panels. And within the first six months of the war, they uh, also destroyed 70% of the wind farms. That was also the, the idea to deprive Ukraine of the, any alternative resources on the, of the energy. Uh, but we're building back, so the, the, the wind capacities are being uh, developed in Ukraine even during the war. Um, we continue to produce half of our electricity by the remaining nuclear power facilities. And it's interesting that there was also the, because of all the Ukrainian <coughs> nuclear reactors were built back in USSR times, so it was Russian technology, and mainly it was Russian fuel. But now Ukraine fully substitute uh, Russian uh, nuclear fuel, uh, substituted by the 
actually, I'd say it's Canadian because this is the Westinghouse company who is now fully owned by um, Brookfield and Cameco. And now all the uranium uh, that is used in this uh, nuclear um, uh, fuel is produced in Canada. So we just last year signed a 10-year long deal where Canada is helping Ukraine to also to provide the energy security with the, uh, within the nuclear power chain. And that's an important role and we, we actually value this, this important strategic partnership we have. Like, first of all, it's like this. I'm still a diplomat, so I can't say what I think. Uh, <laughs> um, but I think it's a madness of Putin uh, trying to um, kind of this idea, stupid idea to like r restore not even the Soviet Union, but the, the, the Tsars, Rus Russian Tsars um, regime. And I think the world also to be very frank, if we were speaking 10 years ago, and I would ask you where Ukraine is, there was a 50% of the response somewhere near Russia. And a lot of people like, no, probably not in Canada, because Canada has the biggest Ukrainian community and many people here like, are familiar with Ukrainian culture and Ukrainian people. Uh, but um, Russia has been doing this policy of eliminating Ukraine as a nation is for the centuries. And there are many cases like Holodomor. Over three million people died in an artificial famine in 1932, 1933, orchestrated by Stalin regime, just to eliminate Ukrainians, especially suffered those who were in the cities, uh, eliminate them like, like a population. It was Stalin's regime who took all the Ukrainian intelligence, like professors, the, the, the famous cultural leaders, to Siberia and kill them there. So this was the whole idea to suppress Ukraine, to persuade the world that Ukraine does not exist. And the problem was Ukraine exists. And the problem was that, you know, the cradle of the, all the Slavic uh, culture is in Kyiv. So this is one of the ancient capitals on the European continent. And so this all Russian propaganda strategy always, you know, when you try to read more, you understand what's the nonsense they are saying. Um, but also it is an existential challenge to Russia. Democratic, successful Ukraine, member of the EU and future NATO member is the existential challenge to Putin because the former Soviet Republic, he suppressed Belarus, Russia, it does not exist. Putin just has took over all the you know, weapons that were existing in Belarus, took it to, to fight the war in Ukraine. All, many of the others, uh, former Soviet Union republics, not, not so prosperous and successful. So the model of Ukraine switching from this kind of um, Russian sphere of influence and becoming a successful democracy is a challenge to Putin's regime because that give a clear signal that there could be the way probably that his regime could fall down. So that's why this was the target. And we saw it uh, back in 2014. So after the, what started as a peaceful pro uh, protest in Ukraine when this former uh, Yanukovych who was at that time the president of Ukraine refused to sign the agreement with the EU for Ukraine's partnership with, with the EU. The people of Ukraine went to, to, to the street with a peaceful demonstration saying, we want to be a member, we want to be in the European family in the future, we want to be a European um, member country. And that's when this was a huge challenge to Russia. So, you know, 
this all green man's the occupation on Crimea and now the full scale war that's the existential challenge for the authoritarian regime so uh you know, for your question, I think the biggest challenge is now in Ukraine. And mobilizing resources is the key thing to help us to win. Uh, because the people of Ukraine continue to fight. But in the reality of the front line, Ukrainian soldiers can use like the ammunition, like Russia prevailing ammunition one to seven that's becoming a challenge. And I think, but the dynamic changes a lot in, all the NATO, in almost all the NATO countries. Um, they, they significantly increase their spendings into the defense sector, uh, including, for example, not a NATO member, but Japan. It's the record highest spendings on the uh, defense and security. Defense industry is quickly ramping up. Because these probably, um, kind of a naivety. Uh, for decades before that there is, a, and the benefits what this international order was giving us, unfortunately, since Russia invaded, um, collapsed. So that's why uh, if we see the dynamics of all the European countries, today Poland investing over 3 point, if I'm not mistaken, 9% of that GDP in defense. UK stepping in, Germany, the country who had his legacy, his legacy during the World War II is now one of the biggest uh, provider of the military support to Ukraine. So this is the time where, you know, I think this, we are all, we, we definitely did it almost 10 years ago, but I think many Western countries are understanding that the previous, probably naivety, uh, is not something that, and that helps today. Thank you. Sir, uh, my name is Ian Fort here at Political Science Student. I just have a question in regards to what we keep in the West specifically. And so you hear you know that Congress have stalled uh, the current arms funding, and there's a chance that uh, Trump might get elected. Is there any like a backup plan or some sort of like um, consistency? Thank you. Um, so with Ukrainian strategy is quite obvious. We will fight because the 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 forty million nation does not want to live under Russian aggression. So we saw what Russia did. I was just and I highly recommend for you to see the first Ukrainian Oscar movie. We just got the Oscar for its documentary this year. Uh, this is the documentary done by the journalist from Associated Press, which is called 20 Days in Mariupol. If you, it's a very hard film. We were watching it with the Ukrainian community just yesterday. I've done it five times, I'm still crying. Uh, but this is, gives you a sense what, how the world looks like. Uh, but also it gives you the sense, you know, why Ukrainians are fighting. Because this, this, this unbelievable, unhuman, and I would say probably like animal behavior, because the human beings cannot just do the things what, what Russian soldiers have been doing with civilians. Uh, so we will fight. Um, what's happening now in terms of the support? We see that Europe is taking the lead. And the European Union just recently uh, approved 50 billion package for the four years in Ukraine, which includes both the military and financial support. Um, many countries, are, like Japan, uh, is unprecedentedly supporting Ukraine financially and supporting Ukraine in, uh, in our rebuilding efforts. There are many countries today. Today, on the table, it's, in so-called Rammstein format, we have 56 countries. And what's also important that uh, we are also building up our defense sector and our defense capabilities, uh, including what I've told you, the drones. Uh, the plan for this year to Ukraine is to produce one billion drones. And from the beginning of the year, we already did 200,000 drones. Um, 
we also are building it in a partnership with leading Western uh, con uh, companies so that we will be able to produce uh, ourselves. And we count on the support of our partners. We are quite you know, optimistic on, on it uh, because it's the interest for all of us together that Russia will once and forever learn this lesson of being defeated. I probably briefly tried to address this issue. Ukraine, back in G20 meeting in Indonesia, President Zelensky <coughs> pulled the Ukraine's peace formula. That's the Ukrainian position. And it was endorsed on, on the um, uh, UN resolution. And it's, it's very clear. Restoration of our sovereign borders, kicking off Russian troops from the country, bringing back all prisoners of war, <coughs> and energy can't be used as a weapon, food can't be used as a weapon, safety to nuclear power facilities, justice and reparation, which is also important because uh, the latest World Bank assessment is that we, the damages to Ukraine economy is $486 billion. And in the same time, 300 billion frozen Russian sovereign assets are still on the banking accounts in the Western countries. And we do believe it's not only morally right, but it's also legally right to seize these efforts, uh, assets and you know, to finance Ukraine's needs, including those that are building. Um, there is a constant discussion in the format of the meetings of the national security advisors of many countries, including from the Global South. Uh, the last meeting was in uh, Switzerland, and there were 82 countries represented on the table. So far more from the you know, NATO and European countries. And uh, we will soon have our, the visit of a foreign minister to India. Um, to, we have also the, the regular dialogue with Brazil, with South Africa, from, uh, from a lot of countries with the global south. And we are also explaining them that it's not only about Ukraine. I mentioned you a lot of things that is of important to many of these countries. For some, Crucially important is the food security. For others, is the energy security. For some of these countries, climate change is an issue. And what Russia is committed in Ukraine is the crime of the ecocide. When Russia last year blowed up the big water dam, there were hundreds of thousands of the hectares which were contaminated by all the debris of the weapons. Ukraine is today the most mined country in the world, more than 150,000 square kilometers are potentially contaminated with the mines. So these are a lot of the consequences and the, you know, I think from the Western Alliance, there are a lot of things, most of the things we share. Uh, from the countries of the Global South, there are specific things that, you know, resonate to them. And we have this open uh, dialogue and discussion. And, you know, our peace formula is, is presented, it's fair, and I think it's important for all of us because the, the other thing will just not work and either will have a very, very damaging consequences for the decades ahead for the security of all of us. Mm -hmm. Just as important as the war is also the peace. 
So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, like what's the future of Ukraine's European integration. So I think we talked about the EU. Yes. Well, there's a lot of talk about like um, Poland and Hungary and a lot of pushback from Ukrainian green exports that are hurting the European farmers. And there's a big protest going on. And also, what needs to happen internationally as well as within Russia to guarantee that something like this never happens again once Ukraine is going to stop? Piece by piece. So, uh, integration. Uh, if I remember well, that was uh, just a few weeks when the full invasion started, when Ukraine officially uh, sent a notice about its willingness to become a EU member and a NATO member. With EU, we had a lot of success and a lot of progress. Uh, so officially, the decision of the European Commission is to start the negotiation and to, to build the framework. We did all the necessary uh, steps to start these negotiations just within a little bit more than a year while fighting the war. So there were like a seven points of the preconditions to start this negotiation. And I think it is a historical decision for us because it's, it will continue to transform the country while bringing our legislation, regulation uh, to the EU standards. It, it will help a lot to, to build the economy, regulation, and to integrate into European markets. Actually, Ukraine already has the free trade agreement with EU. So uh, now EU is a major trading partner. Um, and uh, like the huge number, the biggest uh, you know, trade flow is from Ukraine to EU and backwards, which is the significant change for the last decade. Uh, because previously Russia was traditionally the, um, uh, the biggest trade partner. Now it's totally switched to you and around the, the globe. Um, and it's also the showcase how quickly the country can uh, adapt and the business can adapt uh, to that. We also just signed and ratified in Canada our modernized free trade agreement with Canada. And I think we'll have a huge potential to further develop our trade. Uh, between the countries, and by the way, the trade is growing despite the war. The last year was the record for the last five years, the trade flow around the countries, and even the January, I saw the figures, it continued to grow, which is a good sign. Um, so that's will, that's will, the path of the EU negotiation that will define a lot in Ukraine in terms of our reform agenda, in terms of the, the policy which will be introduced because that's, that's you know, we have an overwhelming support of Ukrainians or so 80% of the people in the country wants Ukraine to become the EU member. Uh, with NATO, Ukraine has the same aspiration to become a NATO member. And I think, uh, and we believe it's, it's for the benefit of both Ukraine and NATO. Uh, and because Ukraine actually today is um, protecting NATO borders, but also in the future, that will secure the, all the eastern flank of NATO. We understand that, uh, unfortunately, the reality is Russia st will still continue to be our neighbor. So the best way, and you will ask to secure post-war, like, security to Ukraine is to Ukraine become a NATO member. Because we see on the examples of the Baltic countries, they are the NATO member. And this is what matters for their security during all these 10 years and especially the last two ones. So this decision, political decision to invite Ukraine to NATO, we, of course there will be some things we, we need to do back at home with, you know, there's some like, a, strengthening the capacity, institutional building. But if we look on the, the military side, Ukrainian troops have already been trained with the NATO standards like from 2015, and Canada was the first one to, to offer this training. Ukrainian soldiers are very efficiently using all the NATO weapons, and sometimes much more efficient than in the NATO countries, because we have not a big amount of those weapons. So the only way for us to succeed is to use them precisely and very efficiently. Um, and NATO will benefit having its member one of the strongest army. 
So this is about the security. So like Washington summit is coming. Let's hope and let's work on it. Uh, yeah, thank you. We have time for one more question, Matt. Thank you. Indeed, um, were uh, force many people to both um, move inside the country and uh, outside the country, uh, and this is also the the huge challenge to to the country because we have over six million IDPs, internally displaced people, inside the country. And as of now, little less than 5 million of people who are fleeing the war and living outside. So most of them are in European countries. Like, for example, in Germany, there is around 1 million of Ukrainians now living in Germany. Uh, the smaller in terms of the territory and population country, Czech Republic, they have around a little bit more than 300,000 of Ukrainians. Uh, in Canada, as of today, we have around 250,000 of Ukrainians who came to Canada uh, during, uh, during the, the time of the full-scale invasion. And um, uh, my assumption is that around 15% already came back home. Uh, and of course, uh, for us, the migration is an issue, especially for the post-war recovery. And the country is not about only its territory. It's important because the country is also its people. Uh, so of course, we want to create the conditions that many people will come back to Ukraine after the victory. Um, but we see that uh, also many of them like Canada has a special relations to Ukraine. We have the, our Ukrainian, the biggest diaspora uh, in, the, in the Western world is here in Canada. We have over 1.5, according to the census, 1.5 million. But I guess it's more because many of the people I meet uh, are saying like, you know, my grandmother was, so I'm Canadian, but not saying I'm Ukrainian Canadian, saying I'm Canadian, but my grandmother was from Ukraine or my grandfather was from Ukraine. There is a lot of this connection. And of course, like that also helped a lot of people to settle down um, and to, um, it will much depend how long the war will last and how quickly we will be able to provide the conditions for people to, to come back. And meanwhile, and we are working with a lot of the communities to also provide the, um, the support for those Ukrainians who came here to, for example, to have the schools for Ukrainian children, not to lose them, their ties to Ukraine, their language, their culture. Many of the people who are, for example, many of them have relatives in Ukraine, so while being here, like finding the job here, they still support Ukraine, they still support and donating to the military. Many of them are also talking about the drones, so the good thing you can do is just buy a drone and send it to Ukraine, Ukrainian. So that, that's, you know, a lot of communities still helping, like whether it's humanitarian support or, or the other stuff. But I think it's one of the most complicated questions uh, that we deal and uh, we just figure out the policies for, for those people. And it also depends because there are the people, for example, who came from Mariupol the city that is almost totally destroyed and now under Russian occupation. So just these people don't have the homes to come back. And there are the people who came from Kyiv or from the western part of Ukraine. And usually many of them make their choice whether they stay in Canada and the other countries for one year or more. Somewhere in this period of time on the May, 
when the children, you know, are finishing their school year, and that's always the decision of the family whether they come back home or stay. So providing in Ukraine access to education, equipping, for example, the schools with the bomb shelters so the children can be safe while being at school and when there is a Syrian and another missile attack, the, the children can go safely in the shelters, but also having the job in Ukraine. And what also, um, in, like, um, what also a significant change in, inside Ukraine in terms of the workforce, uh, we still, we have a huge number of women today serving in the armed forces. We are reaching in all the, you know, um, armed forces and law enforcement agencies. We have around 20% of women now, which is, you know, exceeding many of the NATO uh, countries. Uh, but also still the, a lot of men are on the front line fighting or working in defense industry. So uh, there are a lot of challenges in terms of the structure of the labor force in Ukraine. And now women who are taking care of the families, but also are more kind of empowered to become more economically active. And I was just talking with a friend of mine who is working in the big agri company. They have the first women hired to be a truck driver because they cannot find, you know, the men, because that's, that's the, the shortest. So we see also this, you know, um, the trend inside the country for women taking mm, not very traditional role. In the same time, uh, we are always trying to find positive. So we, we are empowering women. There are special government programs that support women who start their own business, or start their own employment. And that is also a chance for many women to start their business career, to start their business, probably what they haven't done before. Well, thank you very much, Ambassador. Thank you. I think that we can all agree that you provided us with an amazing set of insights and understandings of the very many challenges that you are faced. And we are privileged with the uh, gift of the time that you have provided us with to further educate us, further discuss all these very important issues that are by far will not be resolved, obviously, in the immediate future, but need the long-term considerations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me.